Cool. Do I have your attention? Awesome. Greetings, adventurers. We have a very important update for you today. I've tried to say this four different times and people are still asking. Season two is on hiatus. The cast of Team A, the two people there, got married. They moved. They got a home. They have new jobs and they need a little bit of time. We'll be returning to their story as soon as we're able. In the meantime, please enjoy season three. Thank you very much. Shalis de Pace. Salis. Do you seek him? 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 Do you seek, him? Do you seek, him? Do you seek the nameless god? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, Vin Graveview's conversation with Linzen was cut short. <laughs> The heavy dwarf moved through the air quickly, followed by a deep throat-tearing scream. Something in ever-shifting effervescent darkness had descended from above, wrapping the dwarf in rows of silvery teeth. With oily skin that glistened in the starlight and long flowing lines of bioluminescent tendrils shining blue into sickly pink, a creature, wingless but instead with seafaring fins, had stolen Linzen up into the night sky. Then Grave, who had failed a sanity saving throw and was left on the deck in utter disbelief, completely shocked by what he'd seen. The wet freckles of blood on his face, lending to the idea that it might not be a hallucination. And as Vin looked left and right, seeing if anyone else could see what he had experienced, his legs Lindsay. became rigid like the wood beams beneath him, and he struggled to find breath. As Deckhand Becker called out in panic, those within earshot were ready to action. The Willow's Wake was under attack, and combat began. Ajay was first to act. Ajay puts the book away and throws his hand into the air, and as he does, a winding wooden staff appears in wisps of wrapping shadow, almost as though it's facing the wrong angle, or a shadowy figure from the corner of your eye, almost translucent and hard to perceive, has passed the weapon to Ajay. Ajay aims the staff at the creature and casts phantasmal force, That's creating it. an illusion, an image in its mind that only it and Ajay can see. And this image is that the man in its mouth is on fire. And whilst the fire is illusionary, it will believe the fire is real. Ajay will also prepare himself to maneuver to the side of the ship nearest to where the creature is, hoping that he can throw a rope towards the man if he falls overboard. Lan was next to act, aware only of the sound of screams. So I'm in my room sleeping because I think Yara said something about sea sirens and to just stay in my room. So I took that really seriously and was just like, okay, that's no problem. And after I shared some coffee with the crew, I changed into my formal sleeping wear and turned in early for the night. Okay. Um, Lon, wrapped in silk and salt air, heard yelling from outside her door. There are flying sharks. I repeat, there are flying sharks. Oh, man. I wonder if I can sleep through this. And I roll on my other side so I don't face the door and try to put my pillow over my head and sleep through it. Hmm. Both DMs blinked loudly, have been taking time to acknowledge the expression of horror around the table, but even the gods must permit free will, and supposed that, in this case, Lon was free to do as she wished. <clears throat> After, like, things get a little bit worse or too loud, I guess I'll get up and let me see what's happening outside my room. <laughs> okay, so Nimbo, who was asleep near the stairs, you know, so he could look up at the stars, jumps immediately up when he hears the scream and when he gets to the top and sees the blood and the flying tentacle shark is going to fling a rock with his link to see if it's real or not. Fortin. What in nature's name is that? Is this a dream? <clears throat> Fuck, it's not a dream! The rock hit the creature, bouncing off its fin and landing harmlessly on deck. Vind, frozen with fear, weighed his options. His mind raced, pondered if the creature relied on movement to see, and a staying still might keep him safe. But then he remembered Linzen was in its mouth. This thought pushed Vind past the fear, and his hand sought comfort on the grip of his favorite weapon, a hunting javelin. I'm aiming for a gill! Eleven! But unfortunately, fear had stiffened his reflexes, and the javelin missed its mark, splitting the deck of the Willow's Wake instead. You are supposed to hit the creature, not the ship. What are you doing? Sensing something unpleasant and burning in its mouth, the shark-like creature dropped an unconscious lens into the icy waters and quickly found new prey. A horned half-orc, glowing and moving, jumping and screaming, almost wishing to be hunted. It descended upon him, biting deep into Ajay's side. Ugh! 
Okay, that shark took more than half my hit points in one go. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is fine. This is fine. Yeah, there's no way I just going to do this. I'm going to look at this thing as it chomps down on me and yell, I thought you had enough of fire. And I'm going to burst into flames as I cast hellish rebuke as my reaction. 14 points of damage. Ajay, seeing the shine of countless teeth, preemptively hastened an incantation, immolating the very blood within his body, his eyes practically glowing, setting the shark-like mouth ablaze with his own burning blood as it carved into his side. The creature thrashed out in surprise and pain as some of its teeth cracked within its mouth from the intense heat. Moments before on the port side of the Willow's Wake, scanning the horizon and waves for the mark of sea sirens, sat Lady Viviana Bloodchamber. Set upon spying a mythical creature, she had not seen the dangerous beast floating above the Willow's Wake behind as it swooped down to take Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Viviana preemptively passed her wisdom saving throw, and as she stared off into the darkness, listening, looking, and hoping to catch a glimpse of the siren's mythic beauty, she found that, oh yes, there was something out there. A light, and it grew closer trailing an unnatural darkness that swirled above the water's surface. Closer and closer, it almost appeared as an illusion. But no, surely this shifting darkness grew closer, and within that darkness, more lights began to appear. As the yell of shark behind Viviana grew louder, the darkness began to dispel, and a massive creature emerged from within. A new set of teeth, tendrils, and wingless flight. The beast rushed upon Viviana, rows of teeth hungrily chomping in anticipation as it flew towards her. The creature surprised Viviana with its speed and alien features, and her dangerous glance over her shoulder to see another such creature take Linzen away cost her her footing. The attacking creature was upon her in the blink of an eye, its teeth biting into her arm for eight piercing damage, taking a chunk of bloody flesh from her forearm, but not ripping the limb cleanly off as she'd expected. <laughs> As yet another shadow appeared, dotted with ghostly abyssal lights, moving toward the middle deck toward Yara, who had come up to proudly review his work from the past few days. But the lights in the darkness held a strange and special meaning to the shipwright. Perhaps not these lights, but similar glowing wisps of terrible and bygone days. His eyes immediately found them, and with haunted awe, he was forced to make a wisdom saving throw. Wisdom? Of all things? And all at once, <laughs> the shipwright was entranced, stunned, brought back to a moment in his past. The lights looked so beautiful, and Yara's mind transported him back to that beach, powerless, a hopeless child, unable to defend himself. Dancing lights upon rolling waters, driftwood cathedrals on shaky sands, the futility of it all, the loss, the fire. And then a creature emerged, attached to those lights, one that he still could not, would not see. A beast that dove to snap at the shipwright, biting clear into his shoulder for 12 damage, lifting him off the ground as he sailed past toward the far side of the ship. The pain of pierced skin and the sudden sensation of flying shocked awake the lost and drifting mind of the shipwright. But he was helpless still as he flew 10 feet from the deck, one arm fully within the mouth of the beast and its wriggling tendrils. Firing! Stand clear! Just then a harpoon loose, as the scowling face of second mate Av Mitov aimed down its sights. The shot did little, but enough to shallowly stick the metal barb into the monster's side, surprising it enough to let loose its prey, dropping Yara to the deck. Yara, noticing the other harpoon gun, mumbles to himself, Harpoons! and nearly trips over himself to reach it and swivel it towards the shark as it turns around in midair to attack him again, cheering himself on. It's, it's pretty close to me. How can I miss it? Uh, Famous last words. He fires. Still terrified, his mind yet returning from those glowing lights in his memories, Yara's aim was off. The harpoon flew past the creature into the water, rope trailing behind. First mate Mason Lurs appeared next to Yara from the helm, smearing a thick salve across the shipwright's wound to stop the bleeding. It's going to hurt, but it will help. <sighs> Ow! Good, okay, now help me to reload the harpoon. Convo was next to act. Convo is used to running on deck while he's still half asleep. This isn't his first nautical beast attack, and because he was off duty, he's without his armor. But he'll instinctively grab his hatchet, and when he sees the creature flying above him, uh, his old first mate instincts just sort of kick in. Uh, what the hell's? Quickly, Yelena, Linson, Betcher, get everybody below deck! 
A glow emanated from Convo's back as the tattooed landscape of the volcano trail began to radiate a powerful light, and his body began to change, grow. Convo's muscles stretched as he doubled in size in mere moments, rippling with the strength of a giant and a height of over ten feet. Confident in his power, Convo charged the creature beside Viviana, grappling its head to the 23 and using his reaction to activate another one of the runes woven within his tattoos. His left arm and pectoral, stones surrounding a sword and shield, danced with a magical life of their own, those giant runes shifting to glowing life as he growled at the sharp writhing of his arms. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. And the creature seemed to heed his words, its flails becoming simple twitches as it allowed itself to be pulled to the deck, immobile and seemingly asleep, still held down by the embiggened convo. Viviana, who watched Convo's exchange in the last few seconds, was next to act, her attacker now asleep and grappled to the deck before her. Viviana is quite upset that she was bit and instinctively yells, You asshole! With my unbit arm, I take out one of my family daggers, a very, very pretty dagger, so shiny it looks expensive, and I proceed to try to stab it in the eyeball, wherever that is. Natural 20. <coughs> Viviana rolled quite well on the critical hit chart and unleashed a flurry of attacks. Yeah, every stab, I'm just going, Die, you stupid shark! How dare you bite me! Now I have blood all over my clothes! The bloody and grinning tiefling pulled her dagger from the creature's flesh a final time, covered from head to toe in blood and quite pleased with herself. The beast's glow began to fade, and its body, which had momentarily thrashed on deck, fell limp, its life pouring out over wooden boards. Viviana, who was now in her element, dashed over toward another, hoping to be of help to someone stuck in its jaws. The creature next to Aje was furious, confused and hungry, as the form of Decandulena appeared before it, rushing beneath its considerable bulk and cutting deep into its exposed underbelly as it snapped at the air beside it. Venga da! A low chanting foreshadowed galaxy sea magics as a chilling beam of freezing air shot toward the tendrilled fiend, the resulting wind pressure dropping the temperature of the mid-deck so quickly that visible steam rose from pools of warm blood. Furious, injured, the creature's will slacked and it quickly pivoted, drifting, diving under tumultuous sea to find easier prey. While the Willow's Wake was outfitted with a skeletal crew, they were by no means a weak and witless lot. Their muscle and might was earned at sea under skies both fair and foul, upon waves smooth and mighty. Ajay is bleeding a lot and feeling pretty weak right now, so he's going to look over at the hatch next to him that leads to the hold and make sure that the fluffy prisoner is still in her cage before he makes his move. Glancing down, Ajay could see that the owlbear was still secure, albeit agitated by a mixture of the sounds coming from the deck, the smell of fresh blood, and the cloud of green smoke Mr. Omen puffed towards it. At a thrash, Omen threw the beast a small weasel, calming it for a time. I am glad someone is so chilled on this boat. That is great. We are being attacked by flying sharks while you stay down here and chill with dead weasels. Was that an order or a question? Either way, I'll do that. Seeing that the last shark thing is between me and the stairs to the mess, Ajay is going to cast Eldritch Blast at this creature. 23. Ajay pivoted around to face his target as the end of his staff began to radiate a swirling mixture of shadow and purple light. The glow traveled to the end of the staff, peeling off small sparks of gold from the precious metal-flecked wood, appearing almost like cracks in the miasma. The culmination of this energy directed by the staff's focus shot forth, smashing into the skull the remaining shark near Yara, the crackling glow reflecting on its rolling rows of teeth just before impact. This powerful blast threw the creature into an uncontrolled aerial spin, its tendrils flailing chaotically to find balance. It was then that the door to the guest quarters opened and Lon appeared, dressed in finely stitched sleeping silks. Lon sees that everybody seems to be in control of a situation, so she just stands by and claps at Lady Viviana's bravery and courage and success and uses bardic inspiration on Viviana. Wow, Viviana! That was some great work there, huh? Oh, um, yeah, thanks! Nimble maneuvered himself toward the center of the boat, hoping to avoid being thrown overboard by the chaotic thrashing of the shark. Maybe if I'm unlucky enough, it will just bite me and chill me on the boat so people can recognize my corpse later. <laughs> so I take one of my special stones, a heavy polished round one. Yes, that should do the trick. And I load it into my sling. Finger away, stone! And I fling it with a 15, 12 damage. <laughs> Though perceived as a children's toy to many fighters and hunters around the continent, Nimble Rumble Trout Spine Trout wielded the sling with an unforeseen mastery. 
The heavy stone struck the side of the beast's head, causing an audible crack. The power of the impact stopped the shark's wild spin, and it locked its senses onto the offending halfling. Vind, hoping to aid a friend in danger, calls out to the shark, taunting it into switching its attention onto himself. Over here! Hey! Over here, foul thing! The shark gladly turned its gaze to the screaming prey, locking its black, deep realm eyes with fins. And he throws all four of his javelins at the creature in rapid succession thematically, with a 21 to hit, 7 damage. The golden hair elf threw all four of his javelins in the span of six seconds. A barrage of sharpened wood battered its sturdy hide, and one javelin caught the dorsal fin, skewering it through. This sent the monster into a thrashing frenzy, and it quickly spun, taking part of the willow's railing with it. It descended then on the smell of blood, crashing into the water where Linzen floated mere moments before, taking the deckhand down into the depths with it. Combat had concluded. How is it possible that when you do actually hit the shark, you still do damage to the ship? Gah! Udo, drawn to the deck from the deep galley beneath, surveyed the scene. She did not know what had come to pass mere moments ago, and so smiled as she noticed the large, bloody shark next to Convo. Pleased, she looked to Lady Viviana, who was covered in dark blood from her finely formed boots to her unkempt hair, and chuckled. Ah, so we're having shark tomorrow! Convo, take that to the galley. Yeah, boss. I kinda nod my head and get close to Yelena and mumble. Hey, go help Yaga out. See if you can see any trace of Linson. Yeah, but I don't think... And then, as I'm hearing everyone breathing heavy, trying to get their breath back, I let out a very frustrated snort, and I just pick up the shark and put him over my shoulders. I opened the gate where V was trying to sneak into, and I just tossed the whole thing down there. (laughs) With a muted grunt and a scowl, Convo slammed the door in the hatch before slowly walking down the stairs, his magics fading, and his body shrinking back to its normal size. Is everybody okay? It was only then that Uda made eye contact with Yelena, whose face wore a dejected look of sorrow. With a small shake of her head, Yelena told Uda all she knew of the battle, and her smile disappeared. Uda walked over to place a hand on her shoulder. That was very impressive work. Has anyone checked for Linson? Linson! Oh, no, no, no. Oh, there was someone in the water. I heard it. I, I, that shark tentacle thing, it took someone with it. It looked like Linson. I saw him hit the water, and he was not moving. I do not think our friend is still... I do not think he was still there to save. Gods. If what you're saying is true, we only continue onward. I've checked to make sure that nobody else is missing. Get out, Slooper! Slow and steady! He's dead. He's 100% uh, dead. I was trying to sugarcoat it a bit. But we're all here. We're all here. That's good news. We have, um... We have each other. That's good. (laughs) Good work, everyone. Sorry I took out most of the ship, but uh, we should be okay. Yes, wonderful indeed, everybody. Good job, good job. Such great, great teamwork, everyone. Great teamwork, guys. Great teamwork. I don't know if I would describe this as wonderful. We were told about sirens, but this is a little bit more than that, no? This is awesome. Sirens? Sharks? Someone just died. This is amazing! I take out my notebook and I start scribbling down notes immediately. Yara, I didn't know that there'd be sharks along with sea sirens. I'm kinda excited about dinner tomorrow now. Mom wasn't around to see what happened to Linson, so she views this as a success. Yara, you see him kind of shaking his head a little, looking over the railing with Nimble and Yelena to see if there's any trace or part of Linson left to be seen but he sees even the blood has been taken away by the sea. Seely, having taken shelter in the mess, flies to his shoulder and perches there, but he doesn't notice for once. There's still something off about him, some invisible weight pulling at him. But really he's just shaking his head, distracting himself, undecided what damage to take care of first be it his bleeding shoulder or the railing that he had just repaired. And you can see that he's really upset about the railing, perhaps trying to distract himself from the loss of Linzen. 
and taking eight stress damage. Hmm. The railing. I just fixed it. That was the good wood. That feeling of hopelessness lingered with the shipwright, even after the lights of those creatures were far beyond view. The man he and Convo had shared wine and spirits with, the oldest living crew member of the Willow's Wake, was now gone. Convo, in turn, took eight stress damage. <sighs> Lon's like, hmm, normal day. Did Lon lift a finger when the sharks were around us? She did clap. She, she gave Bardic inspiration. That's nice. Yeah, I did if you're counting teamwork, you know. Everybody pitches in however they can best. Lon's not so much for the fighting as she is for the... encouragement. To also clarify Vin's question, Lon was wearing an embroidered silk sleeping suit. Incredibly fancy attire, even by Elven standards, but ultimately one not suited for battle. My sleeping robe is on, my palm is on them, you know? You know, like, all the comfy and just like... Wow, there's blood. Let me, like, move over here instead. She's done her evening skincare routine and has her little, like, sleep mask all set up. Good job, guys, though. Good job. <sighs> Nimble's still bummed, like, someone just died. He's still looking into the ocean after a couple seconds, minutes. He's not counting time. And... He just hopes to see maybe a corpse, maybe Linson swimming safe, but he doesn't see no one coming up. And he got a rock, one of his stones from his flings, and he whispers to himself, I may have not known you, but may you're in a better place. Now you're one with the water. And I throw a rock and say, May that be with you, so you're not alone down there. And he watches it as it's sinking, and maybe he's not used to seeing how it just keep going down and down to the dark. Like, it's so deep. He thinks, like, what else is there? He had never seen sharks like that. And it's scary. <laughs> And Nimble takes some stress damage, not really sure if he is like or if he can even be prepared for the kinds of dangerous things the waters of the deep sea hold. This is, he thinks now, the lowest point of his trip. He feels awful, he feels ashamed. He felt like this was a big fun adventure and he goes back into the boat, into the mess and sits in the dark. He has the vial, the little bit of water from his home river, and he takes a good long while looking at it, thinking, okay, that's it. I'm not home anymore. Nimble stared at the vial until his eyes grew heavy and he could remain awake no longer. When morning awoke the willows wake, those aboard were no longer as relaxed or as joyful as the days previous. The mornings were dark, void of the sun, as here in the north the sunlit days had grown ever short, and a sadness pushed through the ship like fog. Linzen, the dwarven deckhand and friend to some, had been killed, pulled down beneath the waves. During a closed-door meeting, Captain Gelmain and sea sorcerer Galesk later concluded the attacking creatures were adolescent abyssal trench makos, an abominable bioluminescent amalgamation of shark and squid from the sunken one's deepest depths. Captain Gelmain had announced the previous night, as blood was mopped from the deck, that a funeral service in remembrance of Linzen would be held the following morning. And the time had come. He gave a speech commemorating the man he had known most of his life, the only other person who had known the Willow's Wake like their homeland. He recounted the adventures they had shared and celebrated the dwarf's many accomplishments and his simple, contented life. After, Captain Gelmain asked if anyone else wanted to say a few words. The entire crew, it seemed, had something nice to say about Linson, a story to share. The final crew member to speak was Convo, new as he was to the Willow's Way, but not new to the perils of the sea. He said his piece and ended with a phrase some sailors understood far too well. But Nell Deach has once again come to claim what's hers. The guests observed the funeral with varying degrees of interest. 
Lan briefly considered giving a speech herself, perhaps reading a poem or doing something, anything, as a gesture of respect, but chose to withhold her involvement in any capacity beyond spectator. This was a time she knew her silence was worth more than her words. And it was in that moment that she noticed Viviana was missing from the events. Hmm. I wonder where Lady Viviana went. Oh, Ajay's missing too. And so is Silly. Yeah, nope. Looks like she just caught a rat. Never mind. There are no rats on the Willow's Wake. <laughs> and as the funeral concludes, uh, because he's seen that Nimble is quite shaken with the whole situation, uh, Yara's gonna go real quick down to the deep holes, and he's noticed that this ship, uh, which is quite old, people have taken shortcuts and simply patching things instead of fixing them over the years, uh, he's noticed that there was a huge sack of weighing stones that had been discarded in the deep hold, and he just grabs two or three, which to his eye are nice looking stones, and he just grabs them, and without saying another word, he with a knowing nod, puts them down beside Nimble, who's sitting at the front of the ship, and pats him on the shoulder. You're a good man, Yara. Hope not many sharks bite you in your life. With a nod, kind of confused at the kind but very specific wording, <laughs> uh, Yara goes his way to continue fixing that railing. More than the railing needs to be fixed. <laughs> More than the railing, indeed. And Yara... He's a bit off still from last night's encounter, and his work is still not quite up to the normal standards he holds ship rides to. Both Yara and Nimble recovered to stress damage. Lady Viviana took advantage of the time during Lindsay's funeral to find her way back into the cargo hold. With the crew occupied above, she could now see what it was that interested her so much from before. It's a funeral. I've, I've been to many. It's, it's just the same old one of many, so I'm pretty bored, so I'll take that time to go investigate the cargo. Yeah. Omen she knew was not at his post, as he himself seemed greatly saddened to learn of Linson's death. So it was that even the one room meant to be guarded at all times was left unattended. As she silently stepped through, one of the boxes had a different kind of wood, and this drew her attention briefly. But she continued on, moving toward the owl bear and the prisoner. First, she greeted the owl bear with a smile and enthused greeting, Coffee. throwing in a dead weasel. And then Viviana turned to the prisoner, a bearded blonde man grimed with dirt and sweat. She locked her purple eyes to his crazed gaze. Who are you? Who would like to know? Me, obviously. I'm asking you. You, you, you. I am man. I am flesh made. I am prisoner. I am. Yes, I am a humble follower of the one of grand creation. Fernwein. I am one who follows a path. So what's a religious person like you doing in a cage, then? You see it too. It is a religion. Something... Something views my work as extreme. Yet I'm only devoted, and I'm always faithful. I shall never blaspheme. You must have done something. I mean, no one's gonna throw a religious godly man into a prison for no reason, right? We agree, then, that one acting in the name of the true power cannot be the faulty party. I am innocent. But those who do not understand want me to face trial up north because they worship lesser gods, because they do not see the true way. And I believe this is unjust. Surely you believe it, too. Sure, yeah, believing in other gods, unjust. So what'd you do, kill them? At first, I only tried to show them the path. He grinned. His eyes shifted for a brief moment, as though a cloud lifted, and Viviana thought she could see the stars reflected in his eyes, though even outside the stars were not visible in this heavy sea-fogged morning. Can I at least ask your name? Ula. Ula. 
She takes out a notebook and starts writing. Can you can you spell that? Is it U L A H or like? Ula as the time worn saint. Ula under lies all. U L A Ula. Well, my name is Viviana. You want to be like friends or something? You're kind of cool. Well met, Viviana. I would like that very much. Awesome. Can you also not tell anyone that I've been down here? You know, just because that other orc dude, super, super mean. Friends keep secrets, and yours is safe with me. She smiles and extends her hand through the prison bars for a handshake or something. Rula shook Viviana's hand, gladly clasping it between both of his dirty hands. He leaned his forehead down, as though to touch it to the back of Viviana's hand, not quite in reverence, but in recognition, perhaps, of her nobility. She loves this, and she says, I think you and I are going to be really good friends. I mean, granted, you might be going to prison after this. Actually, I have no idea, but I'll keep in touch. I am to be put to the fire. A death sentence. The trial is a mere formality at this point. The ignorant are unwavering in their misjudgment. Oh, you're gonna die. That sucks. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear about that. Yeah, that that sucks. Um, well, have fun with that. She, uh... You know, friends sometimes could also unlock cages for other friends. Perhaps when we arrive at our first destination. She thinks to herself and goes, You know, you are the first really interesting person I've met this entire trip. Ouch! Somewhere on the ship, Lon felt a splinter. But when she looked, there was nothing there. You are kind. And no, I would not leave such help lacking. I would offer you aid in any way you like, Viviana, my friend. I could tell stories that move mountains. With my components, I could cast spells for you, shape the world for you. With time and penance, I could teach you a magic few have ever spied. Very, um, intrigued and go. Okay, um, sit tight. I will circle back to this conversation. I gotta do something about convo. That dude is like on my ass 24-7 and I'm not sure how to get rid of him yes the tall watcher (laughs) he does not understand but he wears the skin of a painted man a show of the world in many and so few of its forms if only he could see further more colors and beyond his tattoos are really interesting he's very annoying but he looks really cool I don't know. Maybe I'll talk to him. It's a shame he cannot know more. But perhaps we can change that. We could change it? How? Do not discount the power of words. For just as my words call forth magics, they can usher in truth. We need only have an interest in conversation with him. With me outside this cursed cage. Then we could change his mind. Cool. Um, honey, I write down several things on my little notepad, you know. Ula, mysterious religion guy, wants to be freed. Very cool. Also, you have a beard. How tall are you? I'm... uh, What, uh, what system are you using for height measurement? Saps? A palette. Ooh, yeah, I need feet. Sorry, I don't know anything else. Uh, I'm, I'm probably around five, five, six, I think. Shorter uh, than me, okay. And I'm riding. I am not unfaithful to my friends. I can show you power. Bula ran his hands along the inside of the cage, fingers passing over carved runes that began to glow briefly. Strong magics used to dampen the powers of those trapped within. Ula's eyes flickered, reflecting the sparkling stars of the night sky, and the shadows seeming to envelop him now darker than just moments before. You must only trust that I can see as Fernwine deems. 
It is what waits in my dreams. This bounty I can share. Oh yeah, I'm I'm super nice. I'm glad you could see that. Uh... The eulogy will soon end. Please, friend, could you do one more thing for me? Mm-hmm. Can you think really hard? Just think this message. Think AJ is right. His suspicions are correct. He should follow through with his promises terminally. AJ is right. Uh, I'm very intrigued. I'm not sure what you're getting at, but I'm going to do it because this is very exciting for me and also very new for me. And I, I give you my thumbs up and... On the way out, do, can I toss Fluffy a weasel? Viviana picked up one of the limp weasels from the bucket and tossed it to the owlbear cage. In one swift motion, the owlbear happily swallowed, with only a few small bones snapping by the creature's jaw on the way down. Riding down, Fluffy loves dead weasels. Very cute, cool creature. We'll come back for it. And then I take my leave. Back on deck, the funeral had dispersed and work returned. The sails were filled with Galisk's magics, and the willow continued on her way toward the sunken bulwark. A bit later, I approached Lady Viviana, and I asked her, Hey, why weren't you at the funeral? Oh, you know, I have never been on a ship before, Lon, and I just felt so seasick. I was resting. Okay, DM, I want to roll for insights. Uh, five. Yeah, the ocean, the waves, you know, I've never really, like, you know, left my family house that much. This is all very new to me. Uh, you must understand. Sure. So did you stay in our chambers? Yeah, just resting. I see, I see. Well, here's a trick that I learned from, you know, growing up in the mountains that I, I call home. That you can press this. You know, like this this point right here. We call it acupuncture. That you can press this point here on your wrist right here. Yeah. It's going to help with seasickness. This is uh, what my grandma taught me. You can try if you want. Oh, that is so kind of you, Lon. Thank you so much. Viviana does not want to have you having this conversation, so she, she does it. She presses the point on her wrist and goes, Wow. I, I actually feel a little better, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So, did you catch sight of the sea sirens last night? Unfortunately, no. I guess they're just a myth after all. I mean, like, they probably tell stories to scare us off, right? There's no way things like that actually exist. But why do you think they need to scare us off? What's this cause of it in the first place? I'm not sure. Maybe they mistook some sharks eating and taking people as sirens? I don't know. Yeah, that could be it. You're absolutely right. And the seas are so vast, there was never any surety that we will find them. Might I ask the loyal, the royal Lady Viviana, what is your destination or pursuit on this journey? Um, honestly, I just wanted to get out of the house. You must know how it is. I mean, you seem pretty noble yourself, too stay inside all day, not exploring the world, you know? Well, yeah, well, that is very true, but to be quite frank, I actually am on a mission. And I want you to be the first one to know that I am on a mission to recruit as as many, I want to say followers, but people with the same ideal in mind to follow me into a war for peace and justice and ideals that all living beings should have equal freedom. Wouldn't you agree, Lady Viviana? I look at her with a very straight face, put both my hands on her shoulder, put on a serious face, and ask, Are you a cult? Are you starting a cult? Technically, no. But we do have rituals. We do have our own religions, if that is what you're asking. N no, actually, we do. We do have our own country, per se. Our own kingdom, per se. Oh, We have our own cult, sure. It's just that, you know, certain other kingdoms are trying to oppress the living. Our, our presence and freedom, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. This all sounds very familiar to that other guy. You know, I have someone I could introduce you to, if you'd like. Oh, really? Is that one of your, um, siblings, maybe? 
One of your noble family members? Someone oh, with an army, perhaps? No, I fucking hate my sister. Um, no, this guy, he seems like right up your alley, Lon. The whole, uh, religion thing. I think we should all gather together and discuss this because this is exciting. Oh, really? That would be very, very kind of you. I need all the resources I can get, you know? Fighting to free my homeland and all that. Of course, yes, freedom. Love that shit. Freedom, yeah. I'm totally on board with you. Yeah. <sighs> Thank uh, I, I look at her and I press the spot on my wrist again. Yeah, it feels so much better. Feeling good. Thank you for allowing me to impart my secret to you. Of course, of course. And Lon, greatly happy with what just transpired, leaves Lady Viviana B because she doesn't want to be a burden anymore and she feels like she just took a big step forward finding an actual ally for her people. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, I just call out after her. Yeah, what are friends for? Earlier that morning, eyes glinting from the shadows of the cargo hold, the tall form of the antlered half-orc, Ajay Orgun, pressed to the wooden hull behind the cover of high-stacked crates. He did not wish to interrupt the mourning of the crew, and had also thought to use the funeral as an opportunity to learn more about the strange vessel of wood and iron he found himself traveling on. He had watched in quiet interest as Lady Bloodchamber spoke with Ula, keen not to intervene but only to listen, observe. Whether Viviana or Ula knew of his presence was of little consequence. He had nothing to hide. Ajay is so used to being in control of every element of his surroundings as a leader and as a hunter, he knows that predators become prey when they don't fully understand the lay of the land. So, he's going to try and process whether there's a link between something that he read earlier in the book and this stranger that's on board, because it feels like there could be. And not only that, Ajay absolutely wants to see if there's something inside this box, because seeing this strange box now, hearing the murmurs among the crew after dinner, there's just one too many things that Ajay doesn't know, and that really unsells him. Hence why I think he's going to do something a little bit out of character that might potentially break the trust of his hosts. Ajay had heard the name of the god Fernuine, of which he knew little, and yet he had seen the otherworldly depth of Ula's eyes. Ajay ran the man's name across his memory, Ula, as a time-worn saint, Ula underlies all, and yet he could think of nothing. The Book of Vernaskan Myths spoke very little of Fernuine, and nothing of such saints. Arje, with the support and knowledge of his ancestors, wants to try and look back further in his memory, like almost a collective memory. A religion check was required, this time with advantage, as the spirits in Arje's mind conversed, bringing back memories long lost. Okay, that's a total of 19. He knows enough about these Torellian gods to recognize Fernuine's name, the Grand Creator, and the reoccurring pattern within many pantheons. Fernuine is often referred to within the same groups as Neldich, whose island we will reach soon, Bahoka, the deity of death, and his own god, the All Hunter, Ultigan. Yet, reaching deeper through his ancestors' memories, Ajay can only recall that Fernuine valued creation, but not life the creatures, the stars, the colours of magic, and all of the strange things that turn the world. But boundless creation, in the sense of what can exist, what could exist, is, by nature, chaotic. He remembers that the reason his people did not give Fernwine heed was that this creator did not care about their creations, only the act of manifestation. They would consume a fertile valley to spark the first inferno, consume Dilaria to create undeath, and their endless will to create was opposed only by the god of balance and order, Relia. This he read in a book that Relia was also the father of Rive, and the creator of elves, and the father of Bohoka, the god of death, because death itself is an ordering. Interesting. Knowing this, Ajay is going to take an opportunity to approach the box. I want to make sure that I'm not transporting anything that could potentially blow up or something. Some kind of unstable magic. With no one left in the room save the prisoners who were out of sight behind a row of cargo, none could stop Ajay from opening the small crate. After triple checking that the box itself is not trapped and fully safe to open, Ajay will open it. The seal was simple. No lock, no trick. Merely a nail in every corner of the lid. With Ajay's strength, it came off with ease. Within rested a small, delicate figurine, carved from some kind of glistening bone or worse. 
its visage held a strange, almost crazed appearance. And when Ajay held it up momentarily to the small light of the hold's lantern, he could see that it had an almost pearlescent shine to it. Something about it looked familiar. Hmm, some kind of idol. And I would like to make a history check to recognize the art style. Nice. It looks like a carving style of the Southern Chancellor. All the angles and rough geometrics. From history and um, maybe religion, Ajay knows that Jensla has lots of cultures with their own uh, localized deities, which are worshipped along with the larger scale deities, but I don't know which local deity this is supposed to be since there are so many. I think... Before I put it back, I would like to see if I can try and find out what material it's made out of, just in case I should run into that material again. Might help me figure out where it's from. Because I don't think I can bring myself to steal it. As much as I want to, as much as I want to, I'm like... Oh, this sounds like... (laughs) This is such a bad idea. 18. Ajay took time to carefully turn the carved idol over in his hands, running his thumb over the carved face. The deep-set eyes, the sharp, serrated teeth. Ashi's ancestors pulled back, not wishing to be near it, and they whispered winds of warning. Ashi, never have you encountered the beautiful creature of legend that moved through the lands of mortals as guardians and protectors. But now, you hold what is most precious to them. And with a stone in his gut, Ajay knew that what he held in his hands was crafted from unicorn ivory. That is very interesting. Perhaps Ajay will take this. Ajay took leave of the cargo hold, but not before slipping the idol into his pocket and resealing the small crate. The idol, for all its ill will and unseen power, now followed him, and his ancestors kept their distance. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 3, Lure. Created by Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats. Featuring Lily Pichu as Viviana Bloodchamber, Eric Nelson as Vind Graveview, Jasper William Cartwright as Ajay Ogun, Danilo Barascini as Nimble Rumble Trout Spine Trout, Florian Seitler as Yara, Enrique Perez as Convo, Sophie Yang as Lan, K.A. Stats and Travis Vengroff as Co-Dungeon Masters and featuring the voices of Kiera Baxendale, Atticus Jackson, Dario Ullman, Lika Huchashvili, David Devereaux, Michael Heitner, Chris Lurz, Peter Joseph Lewis, and Marisha Tapera. This episode was produced and edited with sound design by Travis Vengroff, with dialogue editing assistance by Kayla Shu, mixing and mastering by Dane Leonardson, transcriptions by Shian Francois, and executive producers Dennis Greenhill, Carol Vengroff, AJ Punkin, and Michael Villegas. This episode features music by David Wise, Atoshi Sakamoto, Stephen Malin, Brandon Boone, and Travis Vengroff. To support this production and get ad-free access to bonus releases, music, world lore, art, and early access to future adventures and DD materials, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash foolandscholar. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.